Um, so while people are joining, can we go down the line and everybody introduce themselves? Um, I know you guys are currently practicing lawyers, so uh, talk a little bit about your practice and, and what you do. I'll start with you, Micah. Good morning. I'm in California, so it's still morning here. Um, my morning. name is Micah Star Liberty. Um, I am the CEO of a law firm called Liberty Law, Inc., uh, and we focus on representing victims of sexual assault and abuse, sexual harassment, and sex trafficking. Um, just to keep things short, I usually introduce myself as a women and children's rights advocate, but we do all sorts of civil rights cases. And I've um, been a lawyer 23 years and had my firm for 19 of those years. Uh, my name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm the subscription attorney. And that means that in order to hire me, clients subscribe to legal services. And, uh, and I'm a general transactional attorney and I don't do anything court related. Otherwise I couldn't offer as affordable prices as I do because subscriptions for me only start at $20 a month. And so I leverage automations and legal tech and, and a lot of non-legal tech to, uh, to sort of get my clients to the end result that they need because when you're not billing your time, you wanna get that client to that end result as quickly as possible. And so I also have a podcast, Law Subscribe, where I talk about this and talk to other lawyers doing that too. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm also in California, so it's still morning. I'm in San Francisco. I'm the founder of a firm here, Lewis and Llewellyn. Uh, you can probably hear I'm British. I started my career as a uh, barrister in England with a wig and gown. So I was a criminal prosecutor in England. And then 22 years ago, I moved to uh, Los Angeles, joined a plaintiff's firm. I then joined Latham and Watkins, one of the largest law firms in the world. And 11 years ago, founded the firm. Uh, we're now 19 attorneys, all former big law attorneys and we specialize in complex civil litigation. And like Micah, we also have a niche practice representing survivors of sexual assault and sexual abuse. So, hello everyone. Welcome back to Answering Legal's 2023 Law Firm Summer Reboot Camp. We're moving along to our second panel here on Law Office Management Day, and our topic for this discussion is the most important lessons that law school never taught you. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for being here. You've all obviously, we, we, we covered this, you're, you're still practicing attorneys. So what would you say are the t some of the toughest lessons that you had to learn about running a law practice that you wish law school would have either taken more time to prepare you for or prepared you for at all? Everything. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that law school should um, be run a little bit more like a trade school frankly, um, and we should learn some of the hard skills um, while we're in law school. I also think there needs to be a much bigger focus on legal writing. Um, I went to a UC law school here in California and we had legal writing, I think our first semester. And then if you wanted to learn you know, more advanced skills, folks would take appellate advocacy or classes like that. Um, I mean, it was a wonderful education and they really taught us how to think, but in terms of the nuts and bolts, I think that um, we really should be doing a better job of turning out lawyers who are ready um, to practice if that's what they want to do. Yeah, I agree with, um, with Micah. Um, no offense, I think law school does a terrible job of preparing people to be lawyers. Like. A law school, you, you debate a Supreme Court opinion is something constitutional, you know, spoiler alert, that's not what we do. You know, so much of our job is just on the phone dealing with people. Another thing I think we need to emphasize is first and foremost, we are running a business. We are a service business. And that means how do you get clients? How do you service clients? What do you do if your client wants you to take a course of action you don't disagree with? You know, again, very much agree with Micah, just the practical realities of being a lawyer. And I, I wish law school would focus far more on that than, you know, some obscure area of the law of trust, which 99.9% .9 of us will never need and never use. We can look up the law. I think you can't look up, how do I service clients? How do I get clients? That's something that needs to be taught. It needs to be learned. And Paul is very polite. I do mean offense. Uh, I, I want law schools to be shamed that they are not preparing their students who are 
most of them graduating with six figures of student loan debt, and they don't know the business of law. I mean, that is shameful, right? And so, like, what has our profession done? Not much. But there are starting to be more and more of these incubators, like the Chicago Bar Foundation's um, Justice Entrepreneurs Project is one that comes to mind because I'm in the Chicago area, and I've, I know a lot of people who have gone through that program. Had the timing been right, I would have loved to have gone through that program, but I discovered it a little too late in my uh, career trajectory and becoming a law firm owner. So I think that... Um, that like the most important thing and, and really Nick, like you and I covered like this for five minutes on the po- on your podcast. So plugging your podcast, everything except the law, although I'm excited for like the deep dive on the subject today um, is like the business development side of things. Like you could have the coolest business model. And I think I do. You could know all of the things about practicing law that help clients in the way that you can and you could offer d- incredible services. And that's great. And you could have all the technology and the systems and processes and outsource the things you shouldn't be doing. But if you can't bring in the business, none of it matters. And so, like, I think the most important thing I've learned that law school didn't teach me is, like, how to get clients. And I'm still learning. You know, the other thing that I'll add, although we have to take professional responsibility and that's part of our licensing, um, actually teaching law students about the ethical rules that we have to follow before they get out into the profession Um, I think would save us a lot of times. Our state bar is, I was uh, former vice president of our state bar. So I, you know, I have an affinity for the organization, but um, they're so underfunded, they can't uh, ferret out and deal with all of the complaints and real consumers are getting hurt. So we should be teaching our our folks how to be, um, not just how to get the clients, but how to make sure we're engaging with the clients Uh, and the court in an ethical way. So I went to business school. I, my, my trade was primarily, I I had a lot of majors. I I ended up back and forth, but when I I ultimately went to Stony Brook and uh, I took all these like business management courses and I thought, how silly to take a management course or like how silly to take public speaking or uh, what was another one I took? I took, um, organizational behavior, which is just kind of like measuring emotional intelligence and like what motivates people. And I use all of that in my actual daily life in business. And for me to hear about what goes on in law school and how like no one is taught, I don't know, management or, uh, or organizational behavior or, or anything like that, I think it's a great disservice to people that we expect to go out into the world, hang, you know, the, uh, hang the shingle, like run their own business and and try to make a living for themselves. What are some things that attorneys can do to become better business owners? Um, Are there any particular habits that they should adopt or mindset adjustments they need to make? Um, And what has worked for you guys in your in your actual practice of of running your, your firms? I um I was building the model for my firm using the subscription model while still at another firm and having to build time. And that was really hard to do. So like the best thing for my business on the business side of things was to stop tying time to money and being able to then productize and create recurring revenues that I can then focus on other revenue generating activities and creating processes and systems in my business and do le- continuing learning. Because when you when you separate making money from having to build time, it frees up so much more time to like make yourself a better business owner, a better person, get more sleep, a better spouse, a better parent, like, a, a, like, and it allows clients to like, you know, you to build relationships with your clients. Cause then you're not thinking, wow, this thing that I'm doing is costing me $500 cause it took me an hour. So like separating that was like a really important thing for me to be able to then continue to do all this other development. But like what, what really got me started was just to, like to start listening to really good business podcasts. And like it's, now there are so many podcasts, like it's really hard to know like which ones are good and which ones are bad. So that's why like the ratings and reviews are great to go check out. I can make a bunch of recommendations, uh, but then we'd be out of time. So um, like listening to good podcasts, reading books, if that's what you prefer, I'm more of an auditory learner. So the podcasts and YouTube videos are really useful for me. Um, and while um, 
Well, I haven't I haven't done it. I know some attorneys who have hired coaches uh, to great success um, in the same way that our clients should be outsourcing their legal problems to us. We should outsource the business stuff to business people unless that's something that we really want to learn and grow. And, and eventually, sometimes coaching lasts forever. Sometimes it gets you to a point where then you can handle it yourself. Uh, so those are my recommendations. I totally agree about the outsourcing. Um, I've never used a coach, but one of the best hires I ever made was a law firm COO. <clears throat> and I learned so much from that relationship and it was so helpful. I also agree, you know, reading books, reading books on even just books on leadership will, will help lawyers in their law firms. We're a contingency fee firm. So, um, we, we, don't have that same pressure about time uh, being tied directly to money for our clients, but um, there are great, you know, business practices to make sure that the clients um, are getting the best service uh, and the best representation we can give them. And, um, you know, there's absolutely no education on how to be service oriented or client focused. Um, as we've already discussed, offered in law school. You know, we always say put clients first. I would even say put your own internal team first. I looked higher people better than myself. And we spend so much time just focusing on getting the best and the brightest. And how can we make your life better? Making sure everyone knows they're valued. If something's going through a personal issue, how can we make your life easier? And I'm proud of the fact in 11 years, no one has left our firm to go to another firm. Uh, voluntarily. And that is something that I'm um, a track record I, I want to keep. Uh, the other thing is we all talk about client service as lawyers. I think every generic law firm website in the world, we put clients first. But what does that really mean? Do you really put clients first? These days, we're not competing with the law firm down the street. We're competing with the the Amazons, the, the Zappos, the Mandarin Orientals of the world. And so I strive to make every touch of my firm a white glove concierge level service, really putting our money where our mouth is. And dare I say it, making it a delightful experience to deal with our firm. Most people come to us as lawyers at very stressful times in their life. They're, they're in a lawsuit, they're going through a divorce, they've been injured, they've been in a car crash, etc. So anything we can do to make that a pleasurable experience. And finally, I like to focus, you know, I, I too love to listen to podcasts, read books, but, you know, I, I read books on sales and marketing. I went to the world's largest sales conference in the world a few years ago in Las Vegas. I think I was the only lawyer there, at least the only lawyer I met. So again, it's just that shift in mindset as a business owner, a service provider, as opposed to, quote, just a lawyer. I, I, I cannot understate like what Paul just said of how important it is that if you go there and you're the only lawyer in the room, how extremely valuable that is also for like business development, right? Like, like I, the moment I stopped only networking at bar association events and I started being the only lawyer in the room at different trade associations or wh whatever sort of conferences, chamber meetings, what have you business started to roll in now don't get me wrong like you like referral businesses and referral practices are very common and like I, I but i'm the one who's referring that business out due to the nature of how my firm is set up and so you know i have those relationships now i'm not getting business because of the way that my practice is so being the only lawyer in the room super valuable and that's not something that they teach you in law school because in law school you're going to events where it's all lawyers and judges and so that's what you do when you graduate and you become a practicing attorney but but i highly highly recommend you find events that are in your practice area or adjacent to it that are not we're, we're, that are not just a bunch of lawyers where you're one of the few lawyers who are there i totally agree and i just want to say before we switch subjects you know whether you bring someone in or have a coach or have a consultant, it's really important for the lawyers to understand everything that person is doing to make sure that they have a handle on um, the trust accounting and the HR policies and procedures and how they're being impacted. Um, it's wonderful to get an education and assistance in those roles, but we are ultimately responsible to make sure we're com in compliance with all of the ethics and all the, the laws that at least my firm fights to enforce. I want to give an anecdotal shout out um, because we were talking about, uh, I, I have a coach. It's probably time for me to re-up on coaching calls. Um, I find it extremely helpful. 
and it, it helps me get my, my thoughts organized. But uh, I wanted to, to make a point on, uh, on having the right team around you and, and empowering them and training them and, and learning how to delegate is, so this, this event is four days long. We're in day three. Uh, I had probably, if you were to give me a percentage of, of the amount that I contributed to the planning and execution of this entire event, I probably gave about 5%. And Monday morning on my way into my office, I had this like very quick, sudden moment of, oh my God, I have no idea what I'm about to walk into. Is the room set up? Do the guests know where to go? Is there, are the topics done? Are the questions done? Is everybody aware of what time they're going to be there? Did we market it enough? And then I had the realization that, my God, Joe, Joe Galati, he's right back there, uh, and Tony, they, they took care of everything. And I have that trust and faith in my team that I don't need to micromanage them. I don't need to see them or, or hear. I know that they did what they said they were going to do. And that, to me, allows me to go run a department. That's really what I do here. I run an arm of the company. Um, I couldn't do that if I was just, I didn't doubt you at all, Joe. I forgot that I, 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 I'm a very panicky person. Um, I want to move on from, from telling Joe how wonderful he is because, uh, I tell him that I think often enough, Micah, I want to, I want to ask you because throughout your career, you've obviously dealt with very difficult and sensitive subjects, um, and clients that are in extreme states of distress. Um, how do you handle the intensity of those cases? Um, and how, I want to know how you, how you train staff to deal, not deal, but like work with your clients in a way that, that you would work with them. Yeah. Well, I can say for the past 15 years, we've been using a trauma informed approach for everything we do. And, um, but for the first half of my career, I didn't know about being trauma informed. Um, so now whether I'm co-counseling with a firm or um, cases that we're doing, everyone that I work with, whether they work for me or not, is required to go through um, trauma informed litigation best practices training. Um, I also, um, because I think it's so necessary in, in the law, have started another business where I will go into nonprofit, small businesses. Um, you know, I even have a Fortune 500 company where I go in to the C-suite or leadership teams and teach them how to be trauma-informed in their everyday interactions. Um, and the reality is, uh, you know, before I did this research and figured this out and self-taught, um, I had terrible boundaries in terms of what I was taking on because of my my the type of cases that I do. So the reason why I do this work just very quickly is when I was 17 years old, a dear friend of mine, um, I went to performing arts school and we were ballerinas together. She was followed home from the gym and raped and murdered by a serial killer in San Diego, California. His name is Cleophus Prince. He's on death row here in California. And he became known as the Claremont killer. Um, so he would follow women home from the gym. He did that to my friend Amber Clark. When she got in the shower, he broke into the house, pulled her out of the shower and raped and murdered her. Her mother came home 15 to 20 minutes later, found Amber dead. Cleophas Prince was still in the home and he killed and raped um, Pam Clark. And so at 17, I had no idea how to work through or even process trauma like this. And I didn't, had no exposure to, to sexual violence or violence against women. So at that age, I committed myself to working towards decreasing violence against women and children. <clears throat> so I went into politics to help with public policy, policy and then became a lawyer. <clears throat> but in the very beginning, I, I, you know, would get so connected to my clients, I was taking on their trauma and not having boundaries. And it led to, you know, complete and total exhaustion. So I had to learn about being trauma informed so I could continue to do the work that I do. And I want to help other lawyers learn how to be trauma informed. Um, Cause it's not just you that can 
you know, get to the burnout stage, your whole organization can be impacted by trauma. So that's a long-winded way of saying I had to figure it out to keep going. That is a powerful story. Um, I'm, I'm truly inspired by that. Um, and I think that after this, I'm going to message you and learn what it takes to become trauma informed. Um, because not that I know anybody who's had that, but I think we all know victims of, uh, of sexual assault or harassment or anything like that. So if I can be more helpful to them, I would like to be. So after this is over, I'm going to reach out if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Matthew, you're the subscription attorney. Um, you're a big proponent of al alternative billing models for lawyers, which is now like this weird fascination. I keep bringing it up. I've brought it up in probably four other panels. Um, why do you feel law firms should be looking to leave behind the traditional hourly billing model? And how do I stop thinking about it? No, I'm just kidding. So uh, the sleazy like sales pitch, like for those like YouTube ad ads that you get, like if you watch YouTube, is how would you like to help more people make way more money and work a heck of a lot less? But the reality is, is there's a massive latent legal market and a huge amount of, of lack of access to justice. And the billable hour simply doesn't scale to meet that latent legal market need. The subscription model does because it aligns the right incentives. And so if you put in the time to build out procedures, automations, repeatable tasks and courses and, and all these different things, and this applies across practice areas, then it's going to be a massive time investment. But when you productize your work, you could scale your business to serve more people and help more people and fill that market gap. I, I can't remember what the, which company, like which like survey company said this, I got to find it because I do talk about this all the time, but worldwide, there's like a trillion dollar market opportunity for the latent legal market. So like I have the podcast law subscribed where I talk to other people about this and I've, I've had other lawyers ask me, well, aren't you worried you're creating competition for yourself? Absolutely not. There is a huge need out there. And the only way we could serve it is if we change the way that we, that we deliver and bill for our legal services. And when you're no longer billing time, you want to adopt technology. You want to, you start thinking about other ways that you can deliver legal services and you're able to build relationships with your clients. When your clients are not afraid to call you because they're wondering how much is this question going to cost me, then you could, then they're going to call you and they're going to actually like bring more work to you because they're not afraid to call you. And so I, that, and that's how I've set up my, my practice. And I talk about my practice at, at Nauseam. So if people want to like, listen to me talk about myself, you can go to matthewkerbis.com. That's my, at my name.com, Matthew with one T and, uh, and you could watch me there. But, um, but really like, it, like it's time the profession moves in that direction. And there are some legal technology companies that are starting to build for that. And if you have not, if you've been under a rock and you haven't heard about generative AI, <laughs> um, like this type of technology is going to cut away at your billable hours if a bunch of other legal tech didn't do that already. So very soon, the more profitable way for you to make money is not going to be billing time. And so it's important for you to start thinking about that right now and how to adapt your practice to do that. Uh, I want to, I'm, I'm trying to go uh, focused questions here at a time. So I got one for you, Paul. And, and this is going to be very secretly... Um, like, what do you call that? Like a guilty pleasure for me because I love to hear you talk about this. Um, so for those here that are running law firms that are currently training younger lawyers at their practice or plan on doing so very soon or in the in the later future, what advice can you provide them with? But more importantly, what would you like, what would you really like to be emphasized more in the training of attorneys in their time at law school? So I think it's crazy that you can pass the bar and you can open a law practice the next day. Um, imagine if that was your surgeon, you're having heart surgery, someone's just graduated from medical school and then they cut your chest open the next day. We think that was crazy, but why do we think that's okay with lawyers? And I personally, I obviously grew up in the English system. I'm a huge advocate of the English system. Before I could stand up in court, I had to do a year's mandatory training called pupillage where I effectively lived the life of senior barristers for a year. I went with them to court every day. I helped them with their papers. It was on the job training for a year. 
the other branch of the English profession, solicitors, um, they have to go two years of training four different rotations you might do litigation or family law or property law etc and for those two years you are called a trainee solicitor you're billed at a lower rate yes firms might take a shorter term dip in profits but ultimately i think it makes you a better lawyer at the end of the day so whether it's implemented in law school could it be some type of mandatory training say in your second or third year where you spend time at a law firm or my preference would be Actually, once you pass the bar, whether it's a year, whether it's two years, some form of mandatory on the job training. Obviously, that's aspirational. We're not there yet. So what do we do in reality? I think it's our job as more experienced lawyers to help with that, that training, that mentorship, um, you know, on the job training. Let your junior lawyers come with you to court, sit in and depositions, sit down them, you know, not just here, give me a draft of a letter or a brief then I edit it, sit down with them, explain why we made those changes, solicit their input as well. You know, I don't just agree with sort of, you know, funneling up. I will often draft an email and I'll send it to one of my, my more junior colleagues, please edit this, or a letter, please edit this. So I think on the job training, anything we can do to help explain the process, the more exposure you can, you can give to the more junior lawyers, the better. Obviously, the reality is Gary's touch upon this. Now, a lot of lawyers are remote. I personally um, am a huge advocate of being there in person. I think you just gain so much more. If your idea of um, law firm culture is sitting in your pajamas, perched in your bedroom on a laptop, you'd rather be doing that than spending time in the firm, then I have not created a good culture. I want people to want to come into the office because that's the learning environment. And the great thing about the legal profession is if you want to be in your pajamas on your laptop, there are firms for you there, or you could go start your own. So there's 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 choices. Paul, I'm curious to know, since you, you're from out of the UK, because what the UK has that, that we don't in the US, which I wish we did, is a bachelor's of law that you could get, you could study law and get an undergraduate degree in law. And we don't offer that here. So do you think that that plays a role too? Yeah. So like I, I, took my law degree 18 by 21 I was uh, I got my law degree the one difference I should have mentioned as well you then have to do another year before you even start that apprenticeship so I went to it's called bar school where effectively for a year they teach you cross-examination they teach you drafting they teach you civil procedure criminal procedure yeah. so in addition to your say theoretical law degree there's this one year additional course which you have to take where they're actually teaching you to be a lawyer so again, I'm a huge advocate of that system as well. Justin, I think Boston College has a four-year law program, and then one of the years is a year-long apprenticeship. But I, I agree with you, Paul. I think it should be, um, you know, maybe a year after you finish before you take the bar or something. But there, there needs to be more hands-on practical um, training for sure. Is my math not mathing, or would that shorten the amount of time that you even had to be in school? Um, like get a four-year degree and then do three years of law school? Are, are you done quicker and, and practicing earlier, even with an extra year in the UK? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because it's five years. The so three-year degree, year at bar school, year's apprenticeship, so five years instead of seven years. But it's five years of legal training as opposed to three years of legal training. Imagine making sense. It's, it's one of the reasons why we don't get a, a warm and fuzzy response from law schools, because they don't want to miss out on any additional years of tuition. I want to ask you guys this, because I think that the ramifications are interesting. And obviously, I can't not talk about it. Uh, I'm talking about AI. Obviously, it's huge. Um, for each of you, what has been your firm's reaction to, to AI? Are you using it? Are you thinking about possibly using it, and how would you? I think um, I think every law firm should be at least looking at using it. And if you're at a law firm that has banned it, that's, uh, that's going to put yourself in a precarious business situation in the future when clients start to demand it. And so it behooves every attorney to at least be looking into it. That doesn't necessarily mean using it in the practice. Um, I am a solo. So like... I am the weakest link from a cybersecurity standpoint. And so I'm able to more easily than a larger firm, even a two-person firm, 
um, from like inadvertently doing something you shouldn't do with cybersecurity risk related to AI or anything else for that matter. But um, but I'm using it everywhere except for like the substantive legal work or anything that could be potentially client confidential information. Um, I have used Case Text co counsel and uh, with varying degrees of success. I think it's incredible. I think it has a little bit of a ways to go before I start using it for substantive legal work for me personally. I also, as a transactional attorney, don't need to do a lot of case law research. It, I need to do it from time to time. But um, for tools like, and I'm, I'm trying to get into the beta for LawDroid's Copilot, that's by Tom Martin. Um, and that is, he built an internal tool for a law firm to use as like, it, like an AI assistant. So instead of having to hire or, you know, outsource in like for a virtual assistant or hire like someone with a master's in English, I can now use this tool that's been trained on legal jargon and legal stuff, which ChatGPT and Bard have not been. And so it's, it's, I think that he's probably using like the GPT-4 API and, um, and like then training it on legal stuff. So that's going to be incredibly useful for me. And now for whatever it's going to cost, five, $5 a month, even maybe even I'd be willing to pay $100 a month if the tool is really incredible and it means I don't have to hire a full-time person. And so like I'm going to be using AI wherever I can and I already am. Um, we, we haven't banned it, but we don't use it in the law firm. We're, we're a trial firm, and um, I, I just don't think there um, is is the right nexus between um, what skilled trial lawyers do um, and and what you know AI can help with. That said, I'm, I'm open uh, if there's a way to help routinize things, but, you know, we've been doing this for 23 years, so we have the routines down, I think, fairly well. Um, I will say that I have three other businesses, um, and we use AI with them. Um, one is a training company for diversity, equity, inclusion, trauma-informed training, and sexual harassment training and the like, so we use it for um, content creation and, you know, wherever we can. Um, the other is uh, a consulting business where I do lobbying and um, consulting for advocates who are not attorneys, helping people go through the reporting process um, and the criminal investigation process for sexual assault and trafficking cases. Um, and then the other one is just a coffee company because I am obsessed with coffee. <laughs> um, and uh, we give 15% back um, to NGOs that help women in coffee because historically women are doing most of the work um, and not getting most of the pay. So um, we use that for promotional material and social media and that kind of stuff for, for the coffee company as well. So, you know, I think it's fun um, and interesting, but, you know, we're not, we're not there yet as a trial firm. Yeah, and I'm very similar to, to Mika's camp as well. I'm certainly not afraid, afraid of it, but uh, I can't say it's revolutionized my practice yet. Um, but, but I'm certainly open to how it can make it more efficient. Let me make some recommendations for the litigators in the room. As a former litigator myself, I was a litigator for eight years before pivoting. Um, this is how I would use it if I were still litigating. I would, for a brief that is, or, or a motion, that's pretty much done, right? Like this is going to be filed. And, and unless it's going to be under seal, like this is going to be matter of public record. And so you, c confidentiality concerns are gone. I would put it into a generative AI, preferably a paid one where there's better security, right? And then I would say, change all passive voice to active voice. I would say, make this shorter or pithier or more like Emerson. And so like, especially if you're hitting a page limit in terms of a filing, you could shorten it while still getting everything across. Or you could put it in and say, what is the strongest argument trying to get X result? And the, the AI will tell you. It's just like having like a really advanced student or, you know, master's in English or something. And then that could maybe make you want to reframe like which argument you put first because, the, you know, judges lose attention spans as they go. So it's not necessarily like doing the substantive work. But it's helping you before you file what was going to be a publicly available document anyway. Also, another advanced technique that you could use is you can uh, different AIs are different, but ChatGPT or GPT-4 lets you let let it, it takes on a persona. 
And so you could say, like, you could put all of the the stuff about the judge who's going to be making a ruling on the motion or what have you. And you could put, like, you are now a judge who went to Harvard, who has X amount of years of experience practicing in this area of law before becoming a judge, which you've been a judge now for 10 years. Like, you really, like, have it take on the persona of the judge and then ask how it would rule on the motion. And you'll be amazed at some of the feedback. Now, this is just like going out and hiring like uh, like litigation consultants, right? But now you've got one like right there and for free, although I don't recommend necessarily the free one. But um, it is amazing, like some of the things that you could get from that when it was going to be public anyway, and client confidentiality issues are are out, out the window. So um, that's it's my recommendation. Uh, Brad asked, which paid ones have good security? So any of the ones that um, are like from legal tech companies, um, I would still like review like what's powering them. So uh, OpenAI has a um, like a privacy policy for companies that are using their API. And I forget what API stands for, but it basically lets technology like integrate with each other. And um, and so they have uh, for certain enterprise clients like HIPAA compliance levels of security. And so you just have to make sure that that company is getting those levels of security and data and, and, and the data is being anonymized or not even used. Like there are certain agreements that with OpenAI, they could have their data not be used to train future versions of, of GPT, of ChatGPT and OpenAI's version of it. So um, like you just have to like do the thing that nobody wants to do and read the privacy policy in terms of service for like your your uh, case text co-counsel or Westlaw is going to acquire them and whatever their AI thing is going to be. Lexus, like this is why brand matters because like these brands, these well-known brands for legal technology companies um, are, you, you know, they're reliable for that reason, but still double check the privacy policies just to make sure. Um, and and other than that, like this is one of the, it's hard. It's hard to answer that question, which is why I'm not using it for substantive like legal work or, or client confidential information yet, even though I'm a big proponent of, of AI, is because we just don't know yet. And so we're still in very much a gray area. So it's hard to know, but I feel like Westlaw would have a lot of law firms suing them if, uh, you know, client confidential information got out when there were other promises made. So um, like I'm looking at the big players and seeing what they're going to do. I have a question that I think no one will disagree with, but, uh, so I don't think it's unpopular to say that law school doesn't train you to have proper work life balance after you're done with law school. Um, do you guys have any tips for lawyers who might be struggling with that balance and, uh, like, I know it's a mindset thing for me is uh, I sort of have to force myself. Like, uh, I go into the office, I'm like you, Paul. I, I, when when COVID ended, I said, can I have my office back? And they said, yes. So I, I come here every day, I sit at the same desk. Uh, I'm not at home. So what's your guys' take on this? I personally am not a believer in work-life balance. And I just wanna put a footnote to that. And that's because I think it's impossible. And I think you can't have a perfect, I'm going to work 37 hours a week. I'm going to work out every day. I'm going to be there for my partner. I'm going to take time for myself, go for a walk. There are times when I have to be all in for work. And so if you're in trial, you're all in. That takes priority. There are times, like a couple of weeks ago, both my young children were sick. Work has to take a back seat and I'm all in from there. So I said, so I'm a believer instead of looking each day or each week trying to take the perfect balance, I think it's bigger sort of over the long haul, the, the sort of big picture. And of course, in that respect, I am a huge um, advocate of that. I'm a huge believer for that. I think first and foremost, it's about self-care. It's about putting what do you prioritize in life? Is it your, you know, exercise? Is it your mental well-being, etc.? So I think it's just making time for that. I think as a leader as a, of a firm, you can't make good decisions if you're not looking after yourself, if you're not prioritizing that. But as I said, I think it's very hard to, to perfectly balance every day or even every week. Uh, yeah, this is something that I um, lecture on all the time around the country and I go into firms and, and help people build what I call a, a rescue plan. Um, I, I think the term work-life balance puts too much pressure on people. And I agree with Paul, you know, it, it, it doesn't exist a hundred percent of the time. And I'm not sure it exists, uh, ever. Everyone needs to figure out what 
what their definition of a healthy relationship with work is. Um, and from there, through discovery conversations and various training modules, um, you know, you can set out a plan. And it's just like anything in business, there need to be key performance indicators to know whether you're striking that balance um, or not. And really it's, you know, I, I don't like the term coach because I, I, I don't think that's what I do. It's a lot more consulting and helping people uh, formulate plans for themselves. Um, but it's, it's how you define it and it's what works for you in your personal life, business life, um, and, and how you relate to, to the world. But, um, you know, if you can, if you can measure it, you can improve it. And so I think that's where it starts with you figuring out what it means to you and what success will look like in terms of having boundaries and sticking to those boundaries. Um, and, you know, it really depends on the area of law you practice. I think if you were, you know, drafting wills and trusts, it's easy to say, I don't work nights and weekends. Um, I try to do that, for example, but I have clients who get 5150 would in the middle of the night and I get a call. That's a, um, an involuntary hold uh, for psychiatric reasons. So, you know, it's, there's no one size fits all, um, but we should really stop um, putting pressure on ourselves to achieve this phantom work-life balance. Yeah, I guess um, I'll round it out there so I could answer this question. And then I know we got to wrap up, Nick. So I'll be quick. Um, obviously, I think if you're not billing your time uh, and if you use the subscription model, so you have recurring revenue, um, worrying about your firm surviving as a business owner uh, is less of an issue. Um, and so it's a little bit easier to achieve balance that way. If you come up with some recurring revenue, even if you're still a litigator, recur subscription plus flat fee can work. Um, also, time blocking like really important. So I'm not perfect because I am a true solo. So it's hard to have accountability partners when it's just you. But at the end of every day, I see who scheduled time with me next day. So like I, I really leverage technology like Calendly for scheduling. And then I have a master list of like things I need to get to, whether that's client matters, things I need to get to daily, weekly, monthly, annually. And at the end of every day, I figure out what time do I have available and I block that time. And I also block time to do nothing. Cause that's really important to, to like, let yourself relax. And so I did a version of this when I was billing time at the end of every day, I would figure out how could I, what are 10 hours of billable time for my next day? So even billable hour firms can do some version of this, but, um, but time blocking is a super useful tool. And, and finally, just like, I, I think of it more like work-life integration. And you know, when you're a firm owner, like if, if you're, or whether you're a partner and you're managing partner, or you're, you have some involvement in running your firm, um, you know, that, that is your life. And like, if you enjoy what you do, it's a heck of a lot easier. And just before you get into that, have a good conversation with your partner or your kids or people involved in your life and just make sure you're all on the same page and having open lines of communication with your non-work life people. And I think work-life integration can work. I love having time to do nothing. Thanks guys. Uh, unfortunately that is all the time we have for this discussion.